Mosque is there. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Hiladi Hadana, Lihada, Wama Kuna, Lina Hadia, Lola, and Hadan Allah. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الحمد وله الملك يحيي ويميت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسله الله للناس نذيرا وبشيرا محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم من عصيانه ومخالفة أمره أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Brothers and sisters, committed Muslims. On this day of taqwa, it is natural to talk about issues of injustice. And it is natural to cite incidents, policies, strategies and other venues where injustice dominates. And as we talk about injustice and the desire to rectify that situation and move it in a direction which makes human beings more secure. We must inevitably deal with how injustice can be minimized either through words or through action. And when we begin to discuss diminishing the amount of injustice that there is, 
especially by acting against it. We often run into the problem of the kind of stereotypes where Muslims are accused of taking action where other people get hurt. Obviously, it is never the intent of Muslims to act in a manner not only which is not indecisive, but also in a manner which does not take account into the dignity of human beings and the societies in which they live. But nonetheless, there's a stereotype out there, even if the majority of Muslims cannot be considered to fit within that stereotype. That stereotype suggests that Muslims are vengeful, that they are bloodthirsty, and they, that they do not value human life in the least. And so we look to Allah's words to give us confidence and to rescue us from these kinds of accusations and misrepresentations. And the words of Allah are all we need. And so in particular, we are going to refer to the eighth and the ninth ayat from Surah Al-Ma'idah. Allah says, Ya ayyuha al-ladina amanu Kunu qawwamina lillah Shuhada abil qist Wala yajri mannakum shana'anu qawmin Ala alla ta'adilu اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون وعد الله الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم مغفرة وأجر عظيم Allah says in his faultless book, O you who are securely committed to Allah, be active and engaged in your devotion to Allah. In affirmation of institutional and social justice. And do not let the hatred of a people deter you from the application of justice. Be impartial, be dispassionate, because this is closest to conscientizing the power of Allah in the human affair. And be conscious of Allah's refractory power. For indeed Allah is well informed of what you do. And Allah has promised those of you who are securely committed to Him and validate that commitment with good works that theirs is not only a forgiveness but a promising reward. Okay. 
This is one of those ayat that if it was the only ayat that was revealed in the Quran, it would have been enough. This is the ayah that gives a station, an upper echelon station to the Ummah of Muhammad. It gives the Ummah of Muhammad a favorable distinction in supervising the affairs of humanity upon a foundation of justice. And this justice sees no national interest, no service to a national security state, and no elevation of national priorities. The committed Muslims have the responsibility to supervise humanity and we don't say this in an arrogant or in a haughty way to supervise humanity with equity and to socialize justice with impartiality and dispassion Now if we take a closer look at this ayah Allah Ta'ala begins the ayah by giving the Muslims a command Kunu qawwamina lillah Be active, be engaged in the matter of justice This is not something that we take lightly no matter of justice ought to be taken in a light-hearted way. Justice is something that ought to be preferred in society. It ought to be a top of mind awareness for every thinking individual in society. And so based on this ayah, Muslims are not allowed to entertain any impulses of aggression, any impulses of occupation, any impulses of war against those who are not themselves actively engaged in hostilities against the Muslims. Another aspect of this ayah, and again, this is lost in translations. Allah addresses Alladina Amanu. And when He addresses Alladina Amanu, He tells them, Shuhada Abil Qist. He doesn't say Shuhada Abil Adil. He tells them to be witnesses insofar as social justice is concerned. Because when we talk about qist as opposed to adl, we are talking about institutional justice. Justice that is re rendered by institutions. Justice that requires evidence. Justice that requires a court of law. Justice that requires the socialization of law in society. Whereas Adil is just generic impartiality, generic fairness. Something that each and every individual has access to. But when we talk about Qist, Qist is something that is established by the motivated impulse of societies. By a collective Iman and a collective Taqwa. By a social Iman and a social Taqwa.
And so when we talk about the responsibility of Alladina Amanu in so far as Al Qist is concerned, we have to back up a little bit with regard to Quranic history. This term Alladina Amanu or Ya Ayyuha Alladina Amanu, O you who are securely committed to Allah, it was never applied to the community of Muslims in Mecca. This designation was only given when the power configuration of Islam was consolidated in al Madina. When Allah's Prophet alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam migrated to al Madina, from that point forward, the form of address by Allah to the social community of Muslims is Alladina Amanu. And this is important. If we are understand if we are to understand the direct and the relevant meaning of this ayah, we have to understand what's going on here. Alladina Amanu is a politically aware group. It is a socially active group. It is an executive group which is responsible for maintaining the order and the security in society. And more than anything, it is a group that has power. If we do not understand the dimension of power, the meaning of this ayah will be lost on us. The meaning of al qist will be lost. And so Alladina Amanu in Medina is a group that has power, social power, economic power, military power. The power to manage your own destiny. And so Allah is talking to a group that has power. The power to do good and the power to abuse. The power to improve and the power to oppress. For if we take a look at the world today, the incurable ailment of superpower, of hyperpower, of empire, is the inability to do justice in society. Civilizations rise and fall on the ability of the leadership to be just. The more just that the leaders of the society are, the longer the chance that this society has to survive. And the more unjust they happen to be, the more they limit the years that this society has on earth. And so this is why this particular ayah was revealed to the Muslims. No Muslim, regardless of how much power he has, and no Muslim society, regardless of how much power it accumulates, has the right or the license to assume an aggressive posture against those who haven't invited such a posture. No Muslim has the right to enter into an aggressive stance even if those other people have given him the emotional incentive to do so. They, have may, they may have done a variety of wrongs, but still the response has to be proportionate. The cumulative effects of oppression 
injustice, discrimination, ostracization, stereotyping can cause a person and a society to snap. And then they can unleash all kinds of anger coupled with all kinds of abuse, human rights and all other kinds. But the Muslims have been given a counsel that they have been entrusted with a system and a social passion for justice. Even against those they may dislike. Even against those they may hate. Even against those who may have done injustice against the Muslims. And so when the Muslims have a chance to set up their own society, when they are at the helm of, of, of affairs, when they are in charge, when they manage their own destiny, then they have to set up a system and a social pattern which is fair across the board, even to their enemies. Power has a way of distracting its executors away from Allah. Those who have power begin to lose focus, especially in matters of justice, especially in matters of equity, especially in matters of the distribution of wealth, especially in matters where that power ought not to be used to occupy the resources of others. They tend to lose focus with regard to the fact that Allah's power is the power that comes first. It is Allah's power that we ought to be cognizant of. For if we abuse our temporal power, then we have to understand by virtue of the meanings of these ayat, that it is Allah's corrective power which will take over. Again, as the ayah says, اِعْذِلُوا <coughs> اِعْذِلُوا be impartial, be dispassionate, because that is closest to recognizing Allah's corrective justice. If we go back to the Islamic historical sources, They indicate that these ayat were revealed to Allah's Prophet in Medina after the Battle of Uhud. In the aftermath of Uhud, word was traveling at light speed around the peninsula that the Muslims around Muhammad had lost a battle to the mushriks of Mecca and that their prophet was humiliated and that now that they were in a position of weakness that all of the mushrik forces around the peninsula ought to take advantage of this opportunity and go to Medina and finish off this Islamic pulse once and for all. And brothers and sisters, as we go through this history, try to associate the world that we are living in today with this prototypical history. And so in the aftermath of Uhud, the forces of shirk, of nifaq, and those forces which were organizing these two, which happened to be the Yahudi factions in Medina, 
they all sort of had a unity of purpose. And key amongst all of these opposition forces, the brains, so to speak, behind these opposition forces, those who are busy spending their time organizing the opposition on the inside of Medina, as well as the opposition on the outside. Obviously, these were the Yahud. And so they sensed that this, if they do not take advantage of this kind of an opportunity, that they may not get another similar opportunity in the future. And so they, they decided to act quickly. And they went to Mecca. And they even went so far as Rome and Persia to try to organize all of these mushrik forces to finish off this Islamic emerging pattern of social justice in Medina. And so it was in this dynamic that a person by the name of Amr ibn Umayyah al-Damri killed two people of the Kilab tribe. Now these two people the two murdered individuals had been given the right of safe passage in and around Al Medina. Despite the fact that the tribe that they belonged to was at a state of war with Allah's Prophet and the committed Muslims around him. And so this person, Umar ibn Umayyah al Damri, he thought that because the Muslims happened to be in a state of war with the Kilab tribe, that it was okay or permissible for him to engage these two Kilabis and kill them. However, as we said, he didn't know that these two, these two particular individuals were, gra were granted the right of safe passage around Medina. And so when the matter came to Allah's Messenger alayhi wa alihi salatu was salam, he determined that this was an accidental homicide. For if Amr ibn Umayyah had known that Allah's Messenger had given these two people proximity security around Medina. He would not have killed them. And so he determined this to be an accidental homicide. And so given that that was the ruling, then the family of these two individuals was entitled to financial compensation. And so Allah's Prophet went to the Islamic treasury and there wasn't enough money there. Now look at Allah's Messenger. He happens to be in a position of power. He was the undisputed power in Medina. He could have said to these people that whatever we have in the treasury is, has to be enough for you. But how could Allah's Prophet be unjust? If He is Allah's hand of justice on earth, and this ayah is saying, I'udilu huwa aqrabu taqwa that is closest to being conscious of Allah's power presence. How is it possible for him, of all people, to shortchange the bereaved relatives of these two individuals and give them less money, despite the fact that he had power? For these ayat are telling us how to properly exercise power. Just because you have power, even if you're Allah's Prophet, doesn't mean you can do anything you want.
And brothers and sisters, look around the world today. Just because you have power does mean that you can do anything you want. Without any moral recrimination, without any legal re recrimination, without any human rights recrimination, without any natural rights recrimination. But it is impossible for Allah's Prophet to behave this way. And so the Islamic treasury doesn't have enough money. What's he to do? But Allah's Prophet was a very smart man. This ought to be a lesson for us. Just because you have the ayat of the Qur'an doesn't mean that you stop thinking. He was a very smart man. He was a very politically astute individual. He was a very forward-thinking leader. He anticipated that when you develop a social order, that you're going to encounter problems and obstacles. And that it's important to manage these problems and obstacles before they occur. It's important to have a conflict res resolution mechanism before a crisis occurs. And it's important to socialize those who happen to be a party to that conflict res resolution mechanism. It's important to socialize them to the way that this mechanism operates before a crisis occurs. And so he did that with Mithaq al Medina, which is the document of Medina or the constitution of Medina. When he first got to Medina, then he collected all the power factions in Medina, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. In fact, most of them were non-Muslims. And he collected all of them. And he caused them to enter into a binding agreement, which had 50 or so odd articles. And one of these articles required the civic constituencies of al Medina. to pay the financial compensation in a collective fashion when such a need arises. And in this case, when Umar ibn Umayyah al dhamri killed these two people, the need arose. And so Allah's Prophet went to, the, to those civic factions who were known to be wealthy. And in particular, he happened to approach Banu an -Nadir. He went to them and he said that uh, we happen to have an agreement that in case the Islamic treasury can't fulfill its financial obligations, that the other civic constituencies to this pact, Mithaq al Medina, are required to come through. And once again, notice the confidence of Allah's Messenger. And once again, think of ourselves today. Whenever we go to ask people for money, even if there's an agreement on the table, we go in a very meek fashion, almost begging. But look at Allah's Messenger. He didn't go over there begging them for money. He said, we have an agreement. We have a civic pact amongst us. And you are required to observe your responsibilities under that civic pact. No begging, no meekness, joint responsibility. And so their initial reaction to the Prophet, who was accompanied by Abu Bakr, Umar, and, and Ali, their initial, respect, uh, their initial response was, yes, yes, of course, Abu Qasim. Finally, you have come to ask us for something. Why don't, you have, why don't you have a seat? Let us give you some food and let's talk about this. And so as Allah's Messenger had a seat outside of their enclave, he noticed that they were going back and forth with each other. And he noticed that something fishy was up. For on the inside, what was happening? 
is that one of their chieftains by the name of Huyay ibn Akhtar. He started petitioning the stronger and the more virile Yahudis that were there. And he started telling them that you not, you're never going to get an opportunity like this again. You're never going to find this man referring to Muhammad. You're never going to find this man in such a precarious position again. Hammer him with rocks and let us be rid of him for good. And so then this became a general feeling amongst them. And they asked, who amongst us is going to go and ascend the wall with a, with a heavy rock so that it can be dropped on Allah's Prophet? And there were those who were amongst them. They said, no, no, don't do this. He's God's Prophet, he's going to know. So don't do this, we're going to get punished very severely. But that was a minority opinion, so they went ahead with their plan. And again, Allah's Prophet, he had a long association with these Yahudis. He had already finished expelling one tribe for their treachery. And so, with all of what was going on, Allah's Messenger Jibreel السلام, informed the Prophet of the plot that was taking place on the inside. And so Allah's Prophet immediately left, went back to Medina. And then he sent a message with an emissary for them to leave the outskirts of Medina altogether. And they refused. And so Allah's Messenger surrounded them and besieged their fortifications for six days and six nights until they surrendered. And so even so, even though they tried to kill Allah's Messenger, there were some Muslims who wanted to deliver disproportionate punishment to these Yahudis, despite the fact that they were planning but never executed anything. And so they wanted to kill all of them. And it was on this occasion that these ayat were revealed. These Muslims who wanted to kill all of these Yahudis of Banu an nadir they had a factual foundation for their position. These Yahudis were organizing the mushriks on the outside and the munafiqs on the inside to unseat the Islamic government of Allah's Messenger. There was sedition on the inside. There was sedition on the outside. And so these Muslims, they had an emotional and a psychological and a factual incentive to punish these Yahudis for their treachery. And because these Muslims may have gone overboard, these ayat were revealed. That when you Muslims are in charge, when you Muslims have the power, when you Muslims have the command, then you ought to be conscious of Allah's power. You ought to be conscious of Allah's justice. And so the most significant aspect of our compact with Allah is the preference to establish, to maintain and to adjudicate justice in a proportional manner, in an impartial manner. And so let us fast forward to today. For that same triangle of terror in the past, the Yahud, the Munafiqs and the Mushriks, they have their analogs in the world today. And their analogs are Bani Saud, Bani Al Asfar, and Bani Israel. Or in other words, Zionism, Imperialism, and Anglo Wahhabism. Or perhaps we could choose yet other words the Holy Trinity of Secularism, Satanism, and Sectarianism.
given this history, and given the fact that we are reading these ayat of the Qur'an every day, we would be stupid. We would be inane to think that there are no contacts between the Yahud of today, between the power Yahud of today, and the power Nifaq of today, between Bani Saud and Bani Israel. And again, you might not be aware, but we are here to fill in these blanks. For the last two years, diplomatic contact has occurred between officials of the Arabian Gulf monarchies and their counterparts in Israel. And these meetings were taking place in Jordan. And representatives of the European Union and the United States were known to be attending these meetings of collective action against the emerging pulse and the emerging vibrance of Islamic social justice in the world. Bani Saud, just a few months ago, or over the last two years, they gave $16 billion to Jewish lobbies right here in the United States to help them lobby the U.S. Congress and the U.S. government. $16 billion to Jewish lobbies, and this is just what we know about. When the Prime Minister of the Zionist occupying entity came to the United States to deliver a message to the U.S. Congress. It has been reported that the royals in Arabia were ecstatic at him giving that kind of speech in which he must have mentioned at least 50,000 times to go and bomb Iran, Islamic Iran. And then more recently, with regard to the war that's going on inside of Syria, there has been a logistical and a military liaison between Jabhat al-Nusra and the Israelis at the Golan Heights, where the Israelis have been equipping them militarily and where they have been treating them medically and then sending them back into Syria. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world today where the more power you have, the less interested you are in justice. There is a controlled absence of functional justice in the world that we live in today. Muslims have no power base that they can call their own every other ideology in the world. You can call it capitalism, you can call it imperialism, you can call it colonialism, you can call it communism, call it what you may. Every other ideology has had or has its power base. But the Muslims have no power base. And for that reason, we are persecuted for committing no crime. And yet those who persecute us are never prosecuted for the crimes they are committing. They are not even allowed to be charged for the kind of injustice they are committing in the world. And you might be aware of this, and again, you might not be aware of this. You, you've heard of this so-called FIFA scandal, where this government right here in Washington raided the offices of the international body that regulates football and the World Cup. And these offices were ostensibly raided for the reasons of fraud and corruption. But what didn't make it to the headlines in the, in the mass media or in the newspapers is that FIFA was getting ready to enter into its final meetings to suspend the state of Israel for persecuting Palestinian football players. 
And so all of a sudden, a corruption scandal erupts against FIFA. There's always a headline behind the headlines. And these ayat ought to alert us to what's going on in the world around us today. يقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه يغفر لكم فاسترشدوه ويرشدكم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله We are talking about issues of justice, generic justice, institutional justice. Institutional justice being the responsibility of alladina aminu. Generic justice being the responsibility of every individual Muslim. Institutional justice being the responsibility of Islamic institutions. Generic justice being the responsibility of every living and breathing committed mu'min. And so once again, as we keep these ayat in mind, we'd like to relate a particular incident to what we're talking about. The previous king of Arabia just recently passed away and was replaced by another one. The so-called Islamic University of Medina. And whenever Islamic is attached to that institution, take that word with a grain of salt. So the so-called Islamic institution, Islamic University of Medina, gave the previous king of Saudi Arabia an honorary degree in political science. Okay, now we, we know that honorary degrees are given all over the place something which was probably started here or in the UK. Generally, it's given to a person who contributed something extraordinary and himself didn't have a degree. Something that might not have been achievable within the university system because the university system at times stifles creativity because of its internal orthodoxy. And so somebody outside the system did something extraordinary and for that reason a university gives that person an, an honorary degree. And so we might ask what something extraordinary did this particular king do in order to deserve an honorary degree from the top so-called Islamic institution in Arabia. Now I don't know brothers and sisters if you've ever heard this particular king trying to read a speech. He can't go four words without stumbling and stammering. Let alone even write the speech. In a sense, you could say that this particular king was functionally illiterate. And so the Islamic University of al Madina awarded an honorary degree in political science to somebody who can't even read. And to boot, this university doesn't even have a political science department. And so it just goes to show you that when you extend approval and allegiance to those who do not know how to rule, then it follows that you give degrees to those who do not know how to read. And so while they're busy giving honorary degrees to princes and potentates who don't deserve them, they're handlers right here in Washington and in Tel Aviv. Even though these royals are very good at following orders, their handlers are busy deciding how to partition Arabia over the next four or five, over the next 20 years. And the plan is to partition Arabia into four or five separate countries. And that plan is being put in motion right here in policy institutes in Washington. And part of that plan is to put Al-Hijaz, where Mecca and al Medina are, under international control. 
And when you hear international control, read, read or understand that to mean the control of whatever power is controlling the United Nations. And right now that happens to be the United States and the Security Council. And so, they say that we are going to partition Arabia and put Mecca and Medina under international control. And so we might ask those who are hatching these kinds of plans, how is that working out for you in Jerusalem? That was also supposed to be under international control. And then, if you're talking about putting Mecca and Medina under international control, why don't you talk about putting the Vatican City under international control? Why don't you talk about putting the holy city of secularism, Washington, under international control? Why does it have to be that the Muslims and their holy areas have to be put under lock and key? What are you afraid of and so far as the orientation of Mecca and Medina are concerned? What are you afraid of? If the committed Muslims acquire control of these areas and restore them to the vibrance that they need to be or that they need to have in a world of injustice. Allahumma adina al-haqqa haqqan razukna tiba'a wa adina al-batila batila razukna ishtinaba Allahumma aghfir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat al-ahya'i minhum wal amwat إنك قريب سميع مجيب الدعوات اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر في اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر أشعر أن لا إله إلا الله أشعر أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاح حي على الفلاح وذق 